So hi, everybody. I'm Howard Friedman. I'm the director of the Jewish Community Library, which is a program of Jewish Learning Works. And I want to welcome all of you to today's program that celebrates the release of Turtle Boy, the debut novel by Evan Wolkenstein. I want to thank our partners, the Jewish Community High School of the Bay, the JCHS Parents Association, and PJ Our Way in the Bay Area. And first, I want to uh, lay down some quick ground rules. Um, because we do have a large number of attendees, everybody is actually going to be muted during the program, except for the presenters. However, we do invite you to use the chat function liberally, which for most of you is at the bottom of the screen. So use it to introduce yourselves, say hello, say where you're from, make any comments, and offer any questions that you would like Evan to answer. I'll then ask them of Evan in the last part of the program. To write a book that dives deep into the feelings of adolescence, one must bring special qualities with them. And Evan Wolkenstein brings not only a stunning intellect, but a tremendous heart. I'm lucky both to have worked under the same roof as Evan for many years and to be his student in a Keva group studying Torah. And I can attest to the commitment and full heart that went into bringing this wonderful book into existence. Sadly, this is one terrible time to bring a novel into this world. No bookstores to display it, no big events, places to sign it. So I do want to encourage all of you to spread the word about the book and to buy it for yourselves and friends. I will send something afterwards with a link to do so. I had to join Evan in conversation. I'm thrilled to welcome my colleague Robin Gluck, the librarian at the Jewish Community High School of the Bay. I miss seeing her in person every day, so it's a thrill to have the gang reunited. So I will now turn it over to Evan and Robin. Great, thank you so much, Howard. Um, I just wanna say congratulations, Evan. I don't know if you wanna jump in here, but I just congratulations on the May 5th release of Turtle Boy. I have my copy here, and I hope you all have had a chance to, to get your copies at home. And I, um, had the pleasure of rereading it uh, when it was in its, um, what's the quiet, quiet word, before it was published, and then reread it after I got my copy at home. And I think that the novel is uh, so special because it, I can see as a, a former children's librarian, it would appeal to the middle readers, but also as an adult, it spoke to me so much. So I, it's a very special novel in that way. Evan, do you want to start by giving us a little synopsis of the, the story? Sure. So Turtle Boy um, is the story of a seventh grader um, going into seventh grade who, um, as the really excellent cover art suggests, he lives in something of a shell. Um, he is a introvert. He um, uh, stays to himself, keeps to himself. He, his family, is, uh, which is just him and his mother, are kind of new in their Wisconsin town. And um, he is somebody who is not particularly happy or really integrated into who he wants to be. Synopsis is what happens when that kid, as part of his bar mitzvah project, his rabbi matches him up with a, a kid in the hospital who's an extrovert, but who can't get out of his room, who has a bucket list of things that he wishes that he could do. And what would happen if the kid in the hospital, RJ, relies on Will to help him achieve his bucket list, and Will maybe will learn something in the journey uh, that will help him to come out of his shell. Nice, nice. Um, it would be nice to like get a little bit of the backstory of how this book was born, maybe the origin story. Can you start by telling us about um, it's the book's creation in, con in connection to JCHS and the Keystone process? I like that particular story, so I want to hear that one first. Well, it's one of the reasons why I thought it would be fun for us to do the, this event together. Um, I had, I was, uh, the doorway to do this project opened up for me at around the same time that you and I were kicking off either our first or second year of Keystone, I, I don't even remember which, but I saw all of our students sitting around the table um, taking these leaps of, uh, of faith in themselves and in the process. They were going to spend a year um, trying something new, something that they hadn't done before, something that would not give them immediate gratification. And we, they were all going around the circle talking about what they were gonna take on and they were shaky and nervous, but also excited. Um, and I was just really at the point of starting to like be like, yeah, this, I, I would like to write a novel. And I sort of blurted out, but like in one of those moments of like, 
this is, you know, this is it. Like, th this is real. I said, I, I'm going to do this as a keystone. And even though I'd told people that I was planning on writing a novel, it, it was almost like it wasn't until I told a, like a group of JCHS students that I was doing this as a keystone that like the real challenge was on, the gauntlet was off. Um, there was some kind of gravity to that. And the weekly accountability to my design team as they would talk about how their work was going and I would talk about my experience. And over the course of the year, you know, we teach the emotional journey of creating anything worthwhile or creating anything great and how it's not just like ramping up in excitement and then, you know, that's not it. It, it goes like that. There's a big bummer of a dip usually in the middle. And over the course of the year, I had those dips and they had those dips and I, I, I felt like sort of held in the process of that. And likewise, I felt that it was able to, it gave me more compassion to be able to guide them as I was walking alongside them doing a project for myself. So Turtle Boy started as a keystone. I think that's part of the origin story. Nice. But there's another origin story. There's also the, the biographical one. So maybe you could say a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, so the story is very loosely autobiographical, but it's like more spiritually autobiographical than like the logistics. Yes, I did grow up in a small town outside of Milwaukee in Wisconsin. The, the book is set in Horican, which is not actually a town. It's just a marsh in the middle of, 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 of southern Wisconsin. But I kind of imagined it as a town. But, um, uh, and like Will, the main character, I did have the facial difference that he's diagnosed with and did have the surgery that he, that he does have. And astute readers may observe that um, Will, so my, my first name is Matthew or Matt, and Will's name is like an anagram of my name, like the W of Will is the M of Matt. And then there's that vowel and the kind of the two stalks of the L or the T. So I, he's kind of like my, he's my alter ego. And there were times when with writing him where the details were not my details. Like I, I did not have a person like RJ who I helped with a bucket list, nothing like that. But different voices of different people I knew entered in, and came in and out of the story. Um, a lot of the Jewish elements are things that I experienced as well. So like, m I think that this is a, some, some books the author is sort of keeps far from the chest. This is a book that's very close to the chest. Nice. Nice. So you have this sort of structural uh, part of the, of your creative process, which was the keystone. And you yeah. have sort of this biographical part of your process, which was, you know, you had yourself, your own story to draw upon, but can you, can you talk a little bit about your own creative process? You had to still harness a lot of creativity to make this happen. Can you talk a little bit about your own creative process and what does that look like and how did that play out in the writing of the book? Sure, so I, so um, a couple of things. One is that at the time that I started writing this, I had been re-practicing my writing skills after about 10 years of not being a serious writer. I was a serious fiction writer all through my 20s. I wrote short fiction. And I was very passionate about it. I went to school to study creative writing. But um, sometime around my late 20s, I, I think I like sort of psyched myself out and hit this kind of writer's block. And I, I really wasn't able to, um, to make it happen. So I put that down and um, was drawing and doing comics and then eventually started writing about men's style of all things. And so that practice of, that practice of getting into, um, uh, writing again and being used to uh, putting my stuff there out into the world, repractice that skill. Um, Gabby, my wife, who's on the call um, right now, um, has been somebody who has been kind of a, besides being my, my, my wife and, and, and often my muse, has often kind of mentored me in the process of um, what it means to go from just having a good idea to getting it out there into the world. And there's a few things that I learned um, that I didn't know in my 20s when I kind of crashed and burned as a writer. And one of those is, if you are too precious about your writing, you're not gonna write anything. Um, artists, serious artists are not, don't take their creativity preciously, they take, they take it seriously, but they take it like it's work that needs to be done. And so I needed to get into the practice of getting up at 4.45 in the morning, which I would have laughed in your face if you had told me before I started doing this, I'd be doing it. And I would put on, this is a secret, nobody can tell anybody, an album called Music for Cats. 
Yes, music for cats. Music designed for cats to listen to. It turns out by David T. Turns out it's excellent music to write a novel to. And um, whether I felt like it or whether I didn't feel like it, I would bang out bad scenes, scenes that were terrible, scenes that were stupid, characters that were awful. And I would bring them to Gabby and I would read them to her and she would say like, that idea is great, that idea is great, and that idea is great. And she was right every time. And so I would take those ideas and just keep pushing that forward. And it made me realize as a Keystone mentor and a design team leader, helping students to kind of like deal with the emotions of their own creative process. She was doing a lot of that with me. I hope that I am returning the favor as she does her own writing. Um, but I think I was transitioning from being an early artist to like a, a practicing artist where, um, just to kind of get teacherly and nerdy for a second, like the word for art and the word for faith and the word for practice are all related. And art is not something that you just like feel. Art is something that you have faith in yourself, you have faith in the process and you have to practice it. And you have to take it seriously like a practice. So I would say that it all comes down to music for cats. Nice, nice. I like the way you sort of demystified the creative process. Like it's, there's a methodicalness to it. And yeah. also that you, like how much support like sometimes we think that the artist is alone, just channeling a muse. And you're, you're like, you're really talking about like bringing people in to see the ugly work that you're doing and then get feedback. I, I love that. I love that. The ugly, yeah, the ugly work is a good way to put it. There is so much garbage that you're gonna be doing as you create anything. And it's very vulnerable and it's really scary. And if you, you need to learn to kind of come face to face with the garbage that you're gonna be creating. And we had a speaker at JCHS earlier this year who talked about when, you're, when you have a good idea and you want to get it off the ground, you have to surround yourself with people who are going to hold you accountable to your ideas, cheer you on, and push you forward. And I, I, I had those people both in Gabby, but also my students and many of you here that are with me today, you were the people who cheered me on when I was feeling terrible or when there was a setback or when my editor said, like, take this one little part and throw everything else out and just like start over from that. Like you were the people who kept me going. And um, I think it's true that like writing, like any art is a longevity game. If you stay in it, you can create something great and you have to learn to come to terms with and to feel comfortable with failure after failure after failure. And then on day 172, then you get a moment of like, ah, uh -huh, I, I dug and I dug and I hit pay dirt. Nice, nice. Let's, um, let's bring RJ and Will into the space. So I, I'd love for you to read chapter seven because chapter seven is that beginning of, we're introduced to a lot of the characters. So let's transition to Evan reading a section of Turtle Boy. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, those of you who are <laughs> following along at home, um, the, oh, the only thing that you need to know right now is that Will is terrified of going to visit this kid RJ in the hospital because Will himself detests, hates hospitals. He's already been diagnosed. He knows later that year he's going to have a surgery that he's terrified of, and he doesn't like any sort of new situation already. Um, and this is where Rabbi Harris, the rabbi, pulls up to the school to bring him to meet RJ for the first time. I'm waiting on the front steps. Give me an okay sign if you can hear me all right. Lots of okay signs, that's good. I'm waiting on the front steps of school when an old white Volkswagen Beetle comes down the long driveway and pulls up to the curb. It has stickers all over the back window, skulls and rainbows and dancing bears. The same designs appear on Rabbi Harris's t-shirt. Ready to do a mitzvah, he says brightly. I know a mitzvah is a commandment or a good deed, but I'm not doing this because I'm commanded by the Torah. I'm doing this because I'm being coerced by Rabbi Harris. I didn't realize this guy is Jewish, I say, as we pull into traffic. Okay, let's review something, says Rabbi Harris. The Mishnah, one of our sacred texts, tells us about the importance of every mitzvah of loving kindness, to make peace when there is strife, to make people happy, to welcome the stranger, to visit the sick. All those are mitzvot. He glares at me. It's not just helping your own tribe. It's reaching out to anyone in need. When I'm not at temple, I'm the chaplain for the whole hospital. I spend time with people who are scared, people who need hope, people searching for the strength to forgive someone, people who just need company. As long as they don't mind hanging out with an old hippie, whatever their religion, I'm their rabbi. 
We drive for a while and then, just as we pass a sign with an arrow pointing the way to the hospital, Rabbi Harris says, now, before your visit, Shmaria, that's Will's Hebrew name and he only calls him Shmaria. Before your visit, Shmaria, there are a few things I wanna speak with you about. His voice startles me because it's serious, almost cautious. I wanna to talk to you about Ralph, he pauses. Hearing this, I start to tense up, I get very still. Ralph has something called a mitochondrial disease. It affects the organs and the cells that produce nutrients. Mitochondria are organelles, I say, not organs. <laughs> That's right, he says. And if these organelles don't work right, the body can start to lose function. Some people can live with it for a very long time and other people, their organs, liver or kidneys or heart, they can get damaged and that can be fatal. My heart is starting to pound. Maybe because of this information, maybe because we're pulling into the hospital parking garage. There are medicines that can keep the organs working as long as possible, says Rabbi Harris, but I want you to know upfront that what Ralph has won't ever go away. Is he going to die? I ask. The words will leave my mouth and the moment they do, I wish I could call them back. Well, Will, says Rabbi Harris, we're all going to die, right? But yes, Ralph is going to die sooner than we will. I managed to walk into the hospital and a nurse looks up at me from behind a desk. Are you Will? She asks. Rabbi Harris said you were coming. I'm Roxanne. Standing here with the weird hospital smells, the sound of buzzers and beeping, I'm already feeling queasy and dizzy like when I visited Dr. Hafetz with mom over the summer. I wish I could leave. The nurse comes around the desk and leads me a ways down the hall to a closed door. She knocks. There's no answer. She knocks again louder. No answer. Maybe he's sleeping, I ask. How about I come back another time? He can't hear us, she says, but trust me, it's not because he's sleeping. She bangs on the door with her fist. RJ, she yells. She sighs and turns to me. He doesn't like it when I barge in, she says, but he's not giving us a choice. She turns the door handle and a strange sound, quick clacking like hundreds of fingers on keyboard keys, pours out from the crack in the door. The door swings open. Rabbi Harris's description of Ralph's illness made me picture lots of machines, sad bouquets of flowers, blankets pulled up to a pale patient's chin. I didn't expect a teenage kid wearing a tropical colored shirt with a string of little shells around his neck. He's thrashing his shaggy hair around and banging with drumsticks on a disc of rubber and plastic about a foot in diameter, sitting on the bed in front of him. He has no idea we're standing here. He clacks and hammers with his drumsticks and his expression is all fury and intensity as if he's trying to beat down a door with his sticks alone. He has thick eyebrows that bunch over squinted shut eyes. But he isn't smashing savagely. Each drumstick's tip strikes its own precise spot, blurring in a perfect pattern like the buzz of a bee's wings. His head bobs to whatever it is in his headphones and finally he increases the tempo and he explodes into a finale. Both sticks smash the rubber disc at once with a final shkabak. Then silence. He pushes his headphones back onto his neck, looks up, noticing us for the first time. You're supposed to knock first, he says. I did, Roxanne says. You're Will, he says to me. Yeah, you're Ralph? No one calls me Ralph, he says, except my dad and Rabbi Harris. It's RJ. He reaches for my hand and shakes it, which feels weirdly grown up. That's when I notice he's wearing a mass of bracelets, brown woven string, excuse me, string and colored threads, five or six of them. The bracelets don't hide the fact that his wrist is so thin I can see long bones through his skin. He may be three years older than I am, but he's barely any bigger. I leave you two to get acquainted, says Roxanne. She shuts the door behind her. I shift back and forth on my feet and wait for RJ to say something. He catches me peering down at the rubber disc on his bed. It's not polite to stare, he says. Oh, sorry, I say, taking a step back. Just kidding, he says. It's called a practice pad. What's it for, I ask. I'm banging on it with drum sticks, he says. It's shaped like a drum. What do you think it's for? At first, I think it's a rhetorical question. One of those questions you're not supposed to answer, but he's glaring at me. Say something, idiot, I tell myself. 
practicing drums? I say. Very good, he says. Here, he holds the sticks out to me. Try it, let's see what you got. There's a little background noise, maybe if we could mute. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, let's see what you got. Oh, oh no, that's okay, I say. Try it, he says more insistently. I shake my head and he steps back again. I, uh, he pushes his headphones over his ears again and bangs on his practice pad, this time more fiercely. His eyes are fixed on an invisible spot on the bed in front of him. He doesn't show any sign of stopping. At first, I feel like it's my fault. Maybe I said something wrong. But as the minutes pass, he continues drumming on his pad, ignoring me. I begin to feel angry. I don't want to be here. And if this guy doesn't want me here, then I should just walk out the door and go wait for Rabbi Harris in the lobby. The only problem is Roxanne might see me leave, and I won't get a signature for my 40 hours for him. Maybe I could find a place to sit and read. Behind me, pushed into a corner, is a large cushion. It's gray and has three layers, almost like a cake. I, I sit down on it, get my book out, and start reading. On my right side is a chest-high case, turned to face the three-layer cake chair. I can see a set of shelves peeking out from behind a sheet that's attached to the top of the case like a curtain. The corner is pulled aside at the bottom, revealing shirts and underwear, a phalanx of five-hour energy drinks in tiny red bottles, a pair of slippers, deodorant, shaving cream, and some white underwear. I assume the stuff belongs to RJ's dad. Maybe he sleeps here sometimes? On the same shelf, I can see a bunch of bags of Funyuns. I've never had Funyuns. Mom doesn't let me have junk food. Suddenly, there's a sharp knock on the door, and it swings open. It's a nurse, not Roxanne, but a different one. She has short gray hair and glasses. RJ stops drumming and sticks his arm out obligingly. The nurse sets up some packaged medical stuff on a tray table. RJ ignores her, and the nurse ignores, ignores RJ as she unwraps a needle. I hate needles. I start to feel faint. I want to leave the room, but I'm afraid I'll pass out. I put my head between my knees, and I start to take deep breaths. Ow, says RJ. Denise! You're trying to find a vein, not dig for treasure. The nurse doesn't say anything back. Then RJ starts singing really loudly. You see the rate they come down the escalator. Now listen to the tube train accelerator. You realize that you gotta have a purpose or this place is gonna knock you out sooner or later. He sings in a loud British accent. Escalator and accelerator and sooner or later. Then he sings, nur, 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 nur over and over like he's imitating an electric guitar. Finally, the nurse sweeps all the equipment into the trash and leaves the room. My head is still between my knees. You all right down there? Drop a contact lens? Needles, I say. I hate needles. How original, says RJ. Do you also hate spiders, homework, and the word moist? Last summer, I needed about 20 blood tests, I say, ignoring his sarcasm. The nurse couldn't find the vein, and she kept sticking me with the needle, and I actually passed out. Oh, wow, 20 blood tests, he says. He still sounds unimpressed. Sounds like an average Tuesday for me. What'd you need him for? I've opened up a topic I really do not want to talk about. I'm just going to keep my head down and see if he changes the subject. What did you need them for? He asks again louder. I was getting tested to see if I might have any, have any joint diseases, I say, looking up. He raises his eyebrows. And I don't, I say, but I have aplasia of the mandibular condyles and micronathia. As soon as I say it, I wonder why I'm telling him these things. I don't talk about this stuff with anyone. I don't know what those things are, he says. Micro, whatever you said. What is that? It means I need, I need surgery on my jaw, I say, in December. Uh, okay, for what? He sits up a little straighter. I really don't like talking about the surgery. It feels different from just thinking about it. Something about the words coming out of my mouth makes it real, and I don't want it to be any more real. I'm waiting, he says. They basically move my jaw forward, I say, and stop. But I feel like I haven't said enough, so I add. And they take bone out of my hip, and they put it in my jaw, and then they wire it shut, and I have to blend up my food so I can eat through a straw for two months. Yum, says RJ. Like one of those ice cream blizzards, vanilla ice cream, Butterfinger, and meatballs. 
I can't believe my ears. This is the scariest, worst thing I can imagine, and he's making fun of it. I'm trying to keep my patience. Mint chip with chicken, he continues. Oh, here's a good one. Chocolate chip ice cream with tacos. Compared to the slop they feed me in this place, it actually sounds good. He grabs his drumstick and plays badumpum on his practice pad. It sounds like badakdak because the pad is made of rubber and plastic. But I still know what he's doing. He's teasing me. I'm not telling you anything else, I say. I pick my book up and angrily page through it. You seem like a perfectly normal weirdo seventh grader, he says. Believe me, I've had my share of Rabbi Harris's dorky bar mitzvah kids come through here, and you're all weenies. I ignore him and continue to page through the book. Do they tease you? He wonders. The kids at school, do they pick on you? I ignore him further, although I realize I'm flipping pages too fast to read anything. Do they call you names? I slam my book shut. Yes, actually they do. What do they call you? His eyes are trained on me and this doesn't feel good at all. He's not asking because he cares. He's asking because he's looking for something new to make fun of. I'm not saying a word, but I've opened my book again and I'm flipping pages and trying to hide my face and I'm crying silently. They call me Turtle Boy. My eyes are fixed on my book so I can't see his reaction, but he's quiet for a minute. Turtle Boy, he repeats. Yeah. So the thing that's making you cry he says slowly, sitting right here in front of a kid you don't even know in a hospital is the fact that kids call you turtle boy. What does that even mean? I don't lift my head, I look at my shoes. They say I look like one, I say, wiping my nose with my sleeve, something about my face. I can feel RJ squinting at me for a second. Come here, he says. I can't see for crap because the mito has wrecked my eye. Come over here a second. I don't move. Come here, he repeats, not loudly, but firmly. I stand up and take a step closer to him. He's quiet for a minute. Oh, uh, yeah, I can kind of see that. Kind of like a cartoon tur turtle because how your chin goes bloop, bloop. He draws a little curve in the air with the tip of his drumstick. What? That's all he has to say? He grabs his other drumstick and starts playing a rhythm on the practice pad. He sings, turtle boy, turtle boy, he's a Jew and I'm a goy. He stops. Rabbi Harris said, I'm never supposed to say goy because it's a derogatory word. He says, sorry about that. He continues playing his, the rhythm on his practice pad. I turn and go into the bathroom for some toilet paper to dry my eyes. I never should have come here. This is Rabbi Harris's fault. I come out of the bathroom and big surprise, RJ's still drumming away. Ticky ticka, ticky ticka, ticky ticka. I have to go, I say quietly. My legs and hands are numb. And my backpack feels weirdly heavy as I lift it by one strap. What? He says. He looks really upset. Where? Why? It's, it's only... He looks at the clock on the wall. You have 45 minutes left. I don't respond and avoid his eyes as I cross the room. Stop, he says. Where are you going? You just got here. His tone changes further as I start to close the door behind me. Get lost, he yells. Who needs you here anyway? I slip my arm under the backpack straps and hustle toward the hallway restrooms as fast as I can without actually running. Thank you. Robin, you are muted. Can you unmute? There we go. Great. I had to get some help, some help with that. Thank you. I love that chapter. Um, it's great to meet Will and understand what, why he's in the hospital and RJ. And um, I guess what, what people don't know, because they haven't read the book, was that, that, you know, obviously Will has to do this work to, to complete his, you know, mitzvah project. But it seems like, um, as their relationship develops, um, it's less about Will helping RJ and it's more about RJ helping Will. 
I mean, I, I'm fascinated by that. I'm like, how much does RJ understand what Will needs to grow? I mean, that's a, it's an interesting relationship because they, they benefit so much from each other. Can you speak a little bit about that? I'd love to. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that Gabby and other reader, early readers feedback was really important about was making sure that I don't fall into the cliche of the like wise guru in the hospital um, because people in the hospital may have a certain wisdom that comes with um, life experience. Um, but I, I want my characters to be human beings and real people who go through illness and suffering also know that like there is uh, there's fear and there's um, doubt and there's wondering about the future. And it's not just like, they're not just like Yoda in the hospital. Like that, that's, that's a given, but as a writer, you can fall into the cliche because you're trying to craft a story. So one of the things that one of the balances I needed to find was RJ is going to need to have some of the wisdom that Will is going to need in order to, to move him forward on his journey. But at the same time, um, Rabbi Harris knew what he was doing when he matched them up. Uh, and there's a certain kind of mystery about why RJ needs Will and why Will needs RJ. And one of the things that's kind of a mystery of the book is um, to what extent does RJ know that the tasks in the bucket list are specifically and coincidentally or ironically or actually surgically exactly what Will needs in order to get him from stage to stage. And on purpose or by reminder of my writing mentors, I made sure that RJ is just a kid who has a little bit more mileage than Will, but is just as afraid and just as feeling as he is. So um, they shift in and out of being each other's guardian angels at times, but never just one or the other. I guess that mystery is what makes it just so beautiful to read because we're always wondering about that and, and appreciating how they each grow from each other's um, tasks and, and fulfillment of those tasks. Yeah. So. And I would also add pushing each other always to the breaking point. Like you can see in this scene, RJ rides Will pretty hard and Will is going to need to go through that kind of um, disappointment so that he hits rock bottom in how he feels about RJ in order to be able to start to build up from there. And I, that's going to be a continuing motif. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know many of the, or I don't know how many people have read the book yet, but we meet many other characters, friends of Will, uh, friends of RJ's in the story. We meet Max, we meet Shira, we meet, of course, Will's mom, Gwen. They're all full characters and I want to know all of them. Um, and so I just, I like, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your creative process around fleshing out these characters. How did, are they inspired by people? How did you build them in your mind? These, these friends and, and people who support and move the, the novel forward. Um, to some extent, I think that, you know, there's this idea in dream interpretation that all people in your dreams are manifestations of you, right? And I think that writing is like that too. All of your characters are like, you know, they say the Torah has 70 facets. And I, you know, I think we all have 70 facets. And I think that like RJ is me and Will is me and Gwen is me and Shira is me. And I think that all those different me's kind of shimmer and sort of come to, come to the story. But they're also me because they're people that have touched me and bear the imprint on me by just gr growing up and going through life. And I think that as I, um, as these characters coalesced, I would sometimes feel like um, if it wasn't in me already, I would kind of imagine a person that I knew that might sort of physically look like the way that I imagined and sort of invite them into the room um, and, 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 cr and create them that way. But one thing I should also add is a, a magical thing that happens in writing is that often you'll have two characters that are not that good and then your editor will tell you that you have to kill one of them. And then you kill one of them, and then all of their Hebrew Jebrew gets glommed onto the other one, and then that becomes, it's like weird alchemy. That person, that character suddenly inflates to 3D. So I think looking around and sort of realizing that like the story, it's like an ecosystem, can only contain so many people. And so um, if it gets too swollen, you have to kind of release some of the, some of the life force and allow it to glom onto other characters. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Um, 
I wonder, you talked a little bit about um, the characters being part of you. I, I wonder how the writing of this book has created a healing opportunity for you. Like you, you know, you, you've talked about this being your story um, and you probably have gone through, and if you've read the final author's note, you have processed this, this story through a graphic novel and you, you've had opportunities to work through it. Obviously as an adult, you would do that, but has it like built a new healing opportunity for you? Have you revisited the turtle boy kind of experience mm -hmm. and, and, and come out of it in a new way, a new, better version of yourself. Hmm. Um, I would say that anybody who does, who has been in therapy uh, would probably agree that um, a therapeutic experience doesn't like resolve something for once and for all, but rather it sort of like pushes all that stuff towards the next level, like sort of towards your next level of personal evolution. So you're better able to contain it or to manage it or to synthesize new stuff, but it doesn't actually like go away. And um, while I have said at times that this book was like a healing process or like for once and for all allowed me to metabolize a fairly painful year of my life, um, I think what actually happens is it continues to, um, almost like a tree with rings, you know, or even like a turtle shell, or made, I had to do a lot of research, are made up of what are called scutes, uh, S-C-U-T-E-S, make up a turtle shell. And they grow rings around them and that's how the, the shell gets wider. And I feel like I have this trauma from my past and over the years through, you know, doing therapy and journaling and good friendships and people that I love, like, you know, like we all do, like we've all go, gone through the process of dealing with the pain from our past. The scoots of the, around that trauma get hardier and, and, built and, and bigger and stronger and more able to withstand impact. Um, and I feel that this book is, is a one scoot among many. It just happens to be a particularly powerfully profound one for me because up until now, it was like a personal celebration of like that year didn't hold me back. Like I've accomplished many exciting things in my life, but now I've actually turned it into a, a book which as a reader and a writer, like I can't imagine a more satisfying thing to do. But um, <laughs> I was recently on a friend's podcast and at the end of the podcast, he asked, you know, what it, if I have hopes about who might read it? And I started talking about, you know, young people reading it and young people, don't, their scoots aren't as developed as adults are and their, their pain is so much more raw and my heart goes out for them. Um, and I hope to help them as, as, as an educator and as a mentor. And I hope that this book can do some of that that I can't do because a 12 year old or a 14 year old can curl up with this and maybe resonate with it and maybe do some of their own scoot building or healing as they go through the process. So I would say like, it's part of a, an ongoing thing. Um, it's not, it's not qu like qualitatively different from the kind of work that I've done in the past, but I think, um, I don't know, like seeing the cartoon alter ego of, it's not me, but it's an alter ego of me, seeing that on the cover makes it feel more solidly held, is probably the way that I would put it, and it, it's a beautiful feeling. But I frequently cry when I read it. When I was doing the audio book, um, I like sobbed during a couple of scenes, and the, the director made some choices about whether I was gonna redo parts or, or not to redo parts because she wanted to maintain the raw emotion, but also not like, um, uh, Ravi Rubin sometimes uses the phrase to allow others to drink from a garden hose, not a fire hose. And I, I want my readers to experience the garden hose and not the fire hose of the emotions that I'm, I'm feeling. So I, uh, but, but it does come up. It, it can sometimes be a live line all the way down to the core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Howard, do you want to, um, I, I'm, I'm eager for the participants to be able to ask questions if they want. And I'm wondering if you, if you, want room for that to bring them into the conversation? Uh, yes, um, so uh, anybody can use the chat right now to ask a question. I received one from a participant that asked, can you, Evan, share more about the grief and death themes in the book, uh, since it incorporates both a parent and a peer uh, dying? Yeah, um, um, I was just talking to Gabby about this. I, um, I was surprised to discover at about the 70%, that's late in the writing of a book, 
that Will's trauma isn't really the fact that he's bullied. And what, and I always kind of bristle a little bit when somebody says like, this is a story of, like about bullying. It's really not. It is a book about grieving and it is a book about letting go and it is a book about moving forward. But bullying is, it's almost like a red herring um, because Will sort of blames his problems on that, but that's not really what's going on. But it took me until like the 60 or 70% mark for me to get real about the fact that Will doesn't have a dad. And that had just been like part of the story. Um, it was like background, like, you know, at the, at, in the earlier stages, he has two parents for a while. He had a brother um, and there were just too many people in the story. So it was like almost like logistically necessary to make some space. But I think one thing that happens with writing is that your, your intuition accidentally makes you do the right thing frequently. And so I cut off and, and um, some of these characters and then realized at like the 60 or 70%, I, my, my writing coach, that's another, by the way, uh, best practice is like, you should have your friends, you should have your colleagues, but like paying a person, Christy, uh, Christy B. Looney is my writing coach. Um, and she sort of said like in our, I don't know, third session, like, Evan, I feel like you're not getting real here about something. It's like, and that's like therapy too. Like you're not being honest. You have a, a father who's, who's dead in the story. And you're just kind of like floating through this. Like, when are you going to confront that? Um, so yeah, a lot of death and a lot of grieving. And I, people who know me know that I'm not a person who I'm a life affirming person. I'm not a person who lives in that world. So why did I write a book that is so deeply about that? And the best thing I could say to that is that I am a person who is obsessed with transformation uh, in all its forms, um, helping other people to transform and my own transformation, all the way from teaching, which is about education, which is about transformation, all the way to when I was doing style ups for men who wanted to dress better. It's all about moving to a new incarnation of who you wanna be. And I think that in some ways, deep down in my dream world, death is, transformation and transformation is always death and that's why it's so powerful and painful to transform because you're letting go of a prior form so i would say this book in some ways was me coming up with the most raw way to confront a very powerful um obsession that of transformation i'll also add my parents are are here with us uh, today which is really great alan and kathy are here and um i want to add that the, you know, the mom character in the story, I think is the hidden hero. And I think that the uh, father figures in the story are very powerful, even though they're divided up amongst a number of different people. And I sort of want to give them shout outs that the model for what love looks like, you know, I, I inherited from and received from them as well as from other important people in my life. And I think I was channeling that as, a, as I went through the process. So while the while I have not I've had the fortune to not have to grieve that kind of a, a tragedy, um, I I do have a ha, have a resonance with um, loss and transformation in general. I think it's something I feel really strongly about. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question from I believe a JCHS student, uh, which is great. Which is how did spending so much of your time surrounded by young people, only a few years older than Will, shape the characters and story? Uh, it's a beautiful question. Um, I, I think the best thing I can say is that as a writer, if you want to be a good writer, you cannot BS yourself. And you will have every opportunity to tell yourself lies. You'll tell yourself that you're bad and you're terrible and you should quit. That's a lie. And you'll convince yourself that some cute idea that you think is incredible is like the best idea ever, and that's a lie. Those are both lies. Um, you are, uh, you do have the potential if you keep your butt in the writing seat, and also you need to be willing to cut stuff out that needs to be cut out. And teenagers are particularly good at detecting BS. Um, if something is not authentic, they will not buy it, and they will call it out to your face. And I think that being surrounded by teenagers all the time is, is a, for an adult is a constant lesson in open-hearted humility. And I can't imagine a better posture for being a writer than open-hearted humility because that's what it's gonna take for you to tell a true story. So even though I wasn't necessarily, you know, in, in, in Chavara every morning, 
um, once in a while, um, you know, my students would like, would the bless, like the, the fullness of their listening hearts, they would be curious, you know, what, what's happening. And I would you know, share a little bit. I was up, I was down. We, we would talk about it a little bit, but I think that the real, uh, the real gift is just being at a school where authenticity and being true to who you are is what we do. And I think that is a beautiful recipe for writing a true book. Thank you. Um, so a, a question from another student. Um, how hard or what is the process of drawing the line between what your editor tells you to change and what you feel needs to be kept in order to keep the story true to yourself? Ugh, uh, another great story. Um, every time my editor would tell me something, I would, um, like Gabby would hear me like screaming in the kitchen about how I couldn't stand that advice and it was wrong and she didn't understand and how was I supposed to do that? And that was the best part of the whole book. And I would say pretty much every time, anytime she said to do something, it was right. It was always right. And one thing that's great about writing on a computer and not like a clay tablet that you can't erase something on is you can always cut something out, scream while you're doing it, put it in a document called cutting room floor, leave it there for two days and then come back and probably you'll be like, what did I cut out again? Like it's probably going to be for the best. So what I would say is I know that receiving difficult feedback sucks. I really get that. It is not fun to receive it. But if the person who's giving you the feedback really intimately knows your work, they're probably right. And even if they're wrong, give it a try because you won't know unless you try it. And it is possible that once in a while I would disagree with my editor, but I would have to really embrace those choices and then make the decision after I saw what it meant. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, another one uh, has to do with it being a young adult novel. And I'll just mm. add, as a librarian myself, I mean, it was always neat for me to see adults say on the bus reading Harry Potter. That was such a, you know, it sort of helped break the, the lines between these genres, which are often very firm. And I'm, uh, I just uh, echo this, this question from the person, what, what was it like for you to write a young adult novel? And what are your feelings towards the genre? Should it be a genre? Yeah. Yeah. I love the genre. I did not, I really did not know anything about it before I started. I was a complete newbie. I had to read a lot. And I would, I started devouring young adult novels because I needed, I, I was a stranger in a strange land. I did not know what the rules were or what the expectations were. And for, in some ways that might've been a good thing. I think I, I, I hold my novel to a very high, Turtle Boy, to a very high level of emotional sophistication. There's icky stuff in there that um, I think that if I was, had an idea already in my head about what a, uh, middle school kid is going to want to read. I might not have included it. You know, the, those are the things that my editor has said, like, this is tough reading, but your kids can, your readers can handle it. You should keep it. Um, so being new and uh, kind of the Zen mind, beginner's mind of it aspect of it, I think benefited me. I didn't need to learn a lot. I think not knowing anything about it gave me some humility. And I think it um, allowed me to get over some of the writer's block that I had felt in my 20s when I was writing what I imagined as very sophisticated, very fancy short stories. And now it was like, they will not read it if it's sophisticated or fancy. They will only read it if it's good. So just make it good, make it interesting to read and, and, and bring it down and make it accessible. And one of the things that I love about middle grade books and YA now, which I read all the time, is how it can't hide behind the artifice of the fancy prose that I think sometimes adult books do. They get caught up in the fanciness of the author or the fanciness of the prose or the complexity of the themes. And those are, those are, those are okay. There's nothing wrong with a book that's beautiful prose. And I think that the, there's a place in the world for that. But a 12-year-old isn't going to read it. It needs to be a good story. And um, I think when I read uh, middle grade books, I have a, a sense of the author being, right, I talked earlier about the author being close to the book versus like kind of disconnected from the book. I think middle grade re writers are often a little closer to their book. Um, the, the, the teacher is, is more there. They're more kind of like present and 
offering their um, them, themselves, uh, sort of a Parker Palmer, the idea of like you teach who you are. I think a middle grade book, you, you write who you are in a way that leaves the door open. So if, if that maybe adds something to it, it it's, a, it's now a genre that I really um, admire. And it's at an age where, you know, middle school is an awkward age physically and developmentally it's an awkward age. And the like books are like kids books are real clear. And then YA books where there's like romance and sometimes there's kind of sexual content, that's real clear. But the middle grade books, sometimes they lean towards being more for kids and sometimes they lean more for being more for adults. And it's just interesting how the genre itself models that age. And um, I appreciate that. And hopefully my book will be one that will add to that conversation and perhaps move the genre forward in some way. I received a, a follow-up question while you were talking, asking if uh, you had a one or two uh, young adult novels that you would actually recommend for summer reading. Uh, yes. Marcy, Marcy Suarez changes gears. I, I talk about that book all the time. Uh, Mer, uh, Mercy, Mercy Suarez t changes gears. Um, it's beautifully narrated. That's part of the power of it. But also I got to hear a story of a Cuban girl growing up in Miami with her Cuban family. And I was like, oh, like the, the culture is so rich and the voice is so true. And there's a real pain in the story and the characters are brilliant. I just felt really strongly about that one and, and really moved. Um, and so I would say like, if you're, if you're interested in what is a beautiful middle grade book read like, um, after you've read Turtle Boy, uh, run out and, and grab, <laughs> grab Mercy Suarez Changes Gears. Um, because it really is beautiful and I really just admire it so much. So, okay, so I think we're gonna uh, close up shop uh, now. Uh, and uh, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank our partners at the uh, Jewish Community High School at PJ Hourway. Um, and I especially want to thank Evan and Robin. This has been a really great afternoon. I love um, just, you know, both hearing your voice narrate the words, but also get all this thought behind the book and the stories that are that that enrich it so so i want to encourage everybody to uh to buy and read the book um i'll send a follow-up email it'll also have a uh, link to a feedback uh, uh form but also have information about getting uh getting the book and the including the audiobook that there was interest in so we can actually hear your voice um anything right. you want to close with evan no um well yes i was there's always something i want to close with um one is um, I want to express my gratitude. I, I, I mentioned earlier, but I just want to hold this for a moment. My, just my gratitude for, I see so many, I'm just looking through the faces here, so many people here who I've confided in, asked about, bugged, uh, talked their ear off, took up a lot of space in our conversations, people who just held me and supported uh, supported the book and you know, believed in me and cheered me on. And, um, you know, too many for me to name now, but you know, you, you know who you are and I'm looking at you right now. And um, so that, that's, I just want to take a moment to hold that. And also um, just to kind of keep the momentum moving forward, um, you know, writing is something that uh, is a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a thing that you need to commit yourself to. It's a, it's a process that you need to hand yourself over to. So, um, you know, even while Turtle Boy is doing all these things, I've started work on the spin-off book, um, which is going to be about Shira, Will's best friend. And uh, I'm already back to the beginning. It reminds me a little bit of like when, when um, Simchat Torah comes around and you finish reading the Torah, like you don't celebrate it and, and just rest on your laurels. You start over again. So I'm writing absolute garbage for book number two. It's terrible. It needs a lot of editing. And I thank all the people who uh, have taught me how to have the resilience to stand up to that. And uh, a special thank you to Robin for helping me put this event together and uh, being a great partner in this event and for learning with me so many of the skills that uh, I think I deployed, um, whether it was teaching kids to do Keystone or whether it was uh, putting a new book into the world. Right. My pleasure. Thanks for bringing us Turtle Boy. Okay, thank you everybody. Be safe, be healthy, and uh, happy Log Bomber. <laughs>